Welcome. This is the third session of Seeking God, Seeking Ourselves, Shuva and the Thought of Rav Aaron Lichtenstein with Rav Nathaniel Helfgott. In this class, we will examine the key themes in the published Tshuva lectures, both in English and Hebrew, of the late Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, one of the intellectual thought leaders of the modern Orthodox world in the last half century. We will look for reoccurring patterns and concepts, how these themes integrate with Rav Lichtenstein's broader worldview, and some comparisons and contrasts to other thinkers on repentance, such as Rabbi Soloveitchik and Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner. For those who have not had the pleasure of learning with Rabbi Helfgott before, he is a both a congregational rabbi at Nativa Shalom in Tinak, as well as a teacher at SAR High School and is, and there and works with their affiliated Machon Siach. And with that, I am going to hand things over to him. And those short, short sources will be in chat soon. They include the sources from last week and new ones for this week. Thank you. Um, okay. And also, um, I guess to make me um, share co-host, if that uh... you are, you're already. Oh, you're ready. Okay, great. Okay, uh, it's wonderful to see everybody uh, again. Um, and uh, again, our our thoughts are always uh, with our thoughts are always with um, what's going on in Israel, uh, and every week it seems to be getting more and more. Uh, intense, and um, so our our, our our thoughts are definitely um, with the hostages, with Am Yisrael, with the Jewish people, uh, as we continue to pray, to think, uh, to hope, and um, so we'll all be Emir um, Tzashem, we'll be together uh, with that. Okay, so tonight I would like to um, I'd like to uh, continue what we, um, when we started, uh, we went, uh, the first week we did a lot of background, uh, where Rabbi Lichtenstein, his biography, his intellectual biography, we discussed uh, some of his major influences in general, <clears throat> as well as in specifically the area of uh, tshuva. We also uh, discussed uh, um where he cites uh, those ideas, but where he seems to, uh, so to speak, almost not reject, but certainly not quote them as uh, central uh, perspectives in his uh, worldview. We then went on to look at uh, where sources in the second uh, shiur, in the second uh, session, uh, where he was very much influenced by uh, especially the the thought of Rabbi Soloveitchik, both uh, as in written form, but he had heard it in oral form in the Chuva Drushes of the 1960s and early 1970s, as well as uh, other ideas that he had heard uh, privately from Rabbi Soloveitchik that uh, show up again and again in many of his uh, published in many of Rabbi Lichtenstein's published writings and and on tshuva, as well as in other uh, settings, as well as oral settings, certain ideas that he kept coming back to uh, of Rabbi Salvechik, in contrast to other ideas that he didn't cite uh, in, in, uh, in great detail. Uh, and we got up to that, and from then, and we closed with the whole idea of tshuva as a commandment, as opposed to tshuva as an opportunity, uh, which was very central to Rabbi uh, Salvechik's thinking, as well as very central to Rabbi Lichtenstein's thinking uh, for Rabbi Lichtenstein, and this is something that uh, he often uh, would return to uh, over and over again, is the notion of the human being as a commanded being is extremely uh, central to everything in his worldview. Uh, the first time God speaks to the human being, it's Vayitzav Hashem Elohim et Adam. The first time God speaks to the human being, it's in normative terms. Uh, it's in, you have to do this, um, you should partake of the world, uh, partaking of the world is itself a mitzvah, and refraining from things in the world is also a mitzvah, and so the sense of the human being as a mitzvah, standing before God, is central, and therefore tshuva, which is central to um, the human condition, uh, how could it not be, how could it just be an option, how could it just be an opportunity, how could it just be something that's a gift, it has to be more than that, it also has to be a mitzvah. And that's what we ended with uh, last week. Um, 
I'd like to continue uh, now uh, and look at uh, central themes of the writings of Rabbi, of Rabbi Lichtenstein. This is uh, the next uh, ideas that we are going to focus on are the ones that repeat themselves the most in all of his writings. Uh, I cited, you know, three or four times where he cites this, uh, but I would tell you that both in English and in Hebrew, um, this must be cited 10, 12 times in the course of uh, the 17 published tshuva drushes. You're talking about 10 to 12 uh, times, sometimes at great length, sometimes not so great length, but this is a central uh, central distinction that Rabbi, Sel that Rabbi Lichtenstein made, and so therefore uh, it's very much uh, important for us uh, to look at that. So Rabbi Salvage, uh, Rabbi Lichtenstein, excuse me, uh, starts out with something uh, that again, he repeats, as I said many, many times, this is not the part that he repeats uh, 10, 12 times, but it is something that he repeats a lot, and it is the basis for for everything else that he does, uh, does. So for Rabbi Lichtenstein, there are five categories of sin or aspects of sin that we have to look at. Sin is multifaceted. Um, we can designate at least five major elements. There is first the wrong itself, the abomination in its own terms, this idea that there is uh, 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 an entity called sin that you have somehow um, brought into the world, Second, there is the fact that any sin assigns priority to our desires as opposed to deference to God's authority. In effect, by doing sin, you have shown that you care more about your own needs, your own desires, than God's. Sometimes that can be very negative, you're rebelling. Sometimes it's just because you aren't careful. Third, there is an impact upon themself. Sin defiles, contaminating one's most inner being. That's why the Bible is full of the image of the metaphor that when you sin, you are tame, you are defiled. And when you become, uh, when, you, when you return to God, you are tahor, tahara, right? Lifnei Adunai titharu, we repeat over and over again on Yom Kippur. Before the Lord your God, you shall become um, purified. Fourth, um, not only have you ignored God, sometimes you've acted against the Almighty, as it were, damaging the divine dominion by doing something that is against his will. Finally, there is a rupture in our relationship to the Almighty, illustrated by the verse which we say on, uh, it's part of the uh, Yom Kippur uh, morning uh, Haftorah, your iniquity have been a barrier between you and your God. So Chet uh, creates a barrier between uh, God. But then comes the, the clincher for Rabbi Lichtenstein. We have here in some five aspects, which might be broken down into two major classifications, the moral and the religious. This is a, this is a distinction that Rabbi, Sal that Rabbi Lichtenstein uh, got from a secular uh, religious thought. Uh, this is used by uh, writers prior to Rabbi Lichtenstein, but it becomes a very dominant theme in in, 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 in Western thought. By moral, I do not mean that which have arrived at our own being of ethical import. For these purposes, I include also mitzvot between man and God, even statutes with no obvious independent. Rather, by moral, I am referring to that aspect of sin that is wrong as such, irrespective of the interrelation of the Almighty. So moral in this context doesn't mean ethical in the sense between human beings, but moral means that it in of itself is a wrong, and the second category, by the religious, I mean to focus on the dimensions of the sinful act that have to do with our relationship with the Almighty. So if you take these five categories of facets of sin that Rabbi, the Rabbi Lichtenstein has divided all chata'im into, he would say there are some that you put in the bucket of moral, of, you would say, uh, you, would, you would call them musari in Hebrew, and some which you would call dati, purely religious. Some that talk about sin in and of itself, the wrong, and some which focus not so much on the wrong, but and the wrong can be to human beings, the wrong can be um, to society, the wrong can be to God, but rather everything that you do has an impact on your relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This latter aspect could certainly be construed as being of universal significance. Every sinner, whoever and whenever they may be, has by his deeds, in fact, interposed himself in the Almighty. 
but it has additional significance both with respect to Jewish people at one level and the individual Jew at another, precisely because the relationship is more intimate. So the idea of religious, right? The idea of the moral is kind of equal across the board, but the idea of the religious, depending on how your specific relationship with God, if it was close, then you've really harmed it. If it was already distant, so you've only harmed it a little bit. Explaining why God refers to himself as being a jealous God, El Kana, with regard to idolatry, the Ramban states that this term is applied only with reference to idol worship by the Jewish people, not by nations of the world. Though the prohibition against idolatry is one of the seven Noahide laws, right? Avodah is considered forbidden to all mankind, all human beings. The element of betrayal, as it, were, as it were, the jealousy in response, however, is understood as specific to the Jewish people. What is true is of idolatry is true of the whole of our religious existence. Since a Jew is more intimately, covenantally engaged with the Almighty, then anything that attenuates or ruptures is to be regarded that much more ser seriously. Of course, if sin is multifaceted, then tshuva is multifaceted. There is moral tshuva, which relates to the wrong per se, corresponding to the, the contamination, the defilement of the self, the tshuva of they shall confess for Rabbi Salav, for Rabbi Lichtenstein. That's what's involved in the process of vidui. The act of vidui focuses on the moral aspect of sin because most sins have two dimensions. They have the moral dimension and they have the religious dimension. So when you engage in vidui, you are expressing that the sense that you've done this sin, you've hurt this person, you've, you've, you've added this dirt to the world. And there is religious tshuva, which reasserts the authority of heaven and tries to make up with the Almighty. The tshuva of lifnei adunai titaru, which focuses on the relationship between you and God. And so when you talk about tshuva, you're talking about two dimensions. And this becomes a major theme in many of the drasha of Rav, Lech, of Rav Lichtenstein, that there can be aspects of tshuva you can achieve without achieving the other one. And, and, and that, that, that uh, lays the groundwork for, a, for, for what we call partial tshuva. Partial tshuva might be successful in some realms and not in other realms. Against this background, let us return to our initial query. What do we make of partial tshuva? Which is all our tshuva. None of us are perfect, and even in our tshuva, uh, we rarely achieve that kind of grandiose vision that we started with uh, at the very beginning of the first session where I showed you the Rambam, who talked about um, that MS. Yesterday you were, you know, you were totally uh, disconnected, and now you are beloved, and you're so close to God, and you're beyond b'makom uh, shabali tshuva omdim, where penitents stand, no one else can, can stand. Most of us don't achieve that. We achieve partial success. And the best proof is that we, you know, many of us recognize that three months down the road, two weeks down the road, we're not going to be so ay 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 the way we were on Rosh Hashanah Kippur. Let us return to our initial choir. What do we make of partial tshuva? Repentance that is fragmentary, sporadic, or inconsistent. I believe that the presumptive answer should be clear. With respect to the passage of they shall confess their wrongdoing, which relates to a particular sin, partial tshuva is indeed fe feasible. While obviously the optimal goal is always total, the absence of that level of tshuva is no barrier to either tshuva or atonement. Okay? A person who, the Gemara, records a dispute as to whether a person who normally transgresses by forbidden eating forbidden fats is allowed to bring, um, is allowed to bring uh, a korban, and again, the Gemara says, even if you're not going to achieve the greatest level of tshuva, you can still bring uh, that korban, even if it's only partial. Okay, here's another passage from a different drasha. Okay? Um, again, two tracks of tshuva, moral and religious. There is also the sinner's reaction to one of two realities that are complementary and even coincident, yet clearly differentiable. His relationship to sin on one hand and his relationship to the Almighty on the other hand. These can be readily described as moral and religious tshuva, respectively. The moral aspect of tshuva focuses on the sinful act 
as an incarnate evil reality. In this sense, sin's impact is multiple. There is first the specific wrong in its naked isolation. Second, it has a contaminating effect on the world, either in the rational sense that evil radiates socially or in the metaphysical sense that even a single mitzvah affects the fabric of the entire cosmic order. So whether you're a Litvak, a Misnagid, or you're a Hasid and Kabbalist, the idea that evil has an impact on society and the world or on the cosmic world, on the metaphysical, either it has a, an impact on the social world or on the metasocial world, the metaphysical world. Third, sin has a contaminant upon the sinner's soul, whether on the rational, psychological plane or the, or the mystical. The religious impact of sin with reference not to the act, but to the, our relationship to the Almighty also has m multiple aspects. So moral is the sin itself and its impact on us and its impact on our society and its impact on maybe the metaphysics. Religious ha has to do with our what sin does to our relationship with God. For every sin by definition is an affront to the Almighty. You assign priority to one's will as opposed to God's will. Second, there is salva reverentia, an impact upon divine majesty. You somehow are diminishing God's presence in the world by doing sin because you're basically stating that God is not the one who, so to speak, runs the world and, 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 and is the melech malcheam lachim. You're demu uh, diminishing God's uh, presence. Of Third, sin establishes a divisive barrier that interposed between sinner and the Almighty, illustrated by the celebrated phrasing of the Rambam, as I mentioned before. As he contrasts the sinner's renewed status with it, but only yesterday the sinner was divided from God. The Lord of Israel, as it states, your iniquities have been a barrier. He would call out to God without being answered. He would perform mitzvot, only to have them thrown back in his face. Thus, there are two broad categories of sin, moral and religious, each multifaceted, and they are correspondingly two tracks, apart from the first already mentioned, to tshuva. And again, what Rabbi Lichtenstein loves to do in these drashot is to, so to speak, chop it up and discuss what elements of in tshuva relate to the moral dimension of trying to do tshuva from the sin, the moral element of the sin, as opposed to what elements of tshuva are focusing on the religious element of re-establishing uh, our relationship with the Rabboni Shalom. These two aspects of tshuva reflect different orientations. Moral tshuva is rooted, and here again, he's going to focus. We all are very familiar with the famous statement of Maimonides at the beginning of Hilcho Tshuva, that Tshuva, in its basic sense, has three uh, elements. Number one, Charata, uh, al, I'm sorry, has Hakarata Chet, recognition of the sin, which is very much connected to saying the Vidui, saying the confessional, which is a recognition that I did something wrong. If I have absolutely, if I'm totally a space cadet, and I don't realize I did something wrong, then I can't even get to first base. So that's hakarata chet. And number two, as Rambam says, harata al ha'avar, you regret what you did in the past. That's all in the vidui. Ashamnu, bagadnu, gazalnu. And then there is kabbalah le'atid, Rambam says, is I declare that I don't, and I hope, and I affirm that I will never do this again. I take upon myself that I am a changed person. I will not do this. So Rabbi, Salve, Rabbi Lichtenstein, again, distinguishes. Moral tshuva is rooted in the past, as it is anchored in a desire to break with the previous modes of existence and experience. As such, it is aroused by guilt and recognition of sin. This includes both an awareness of particular sin, vidui, confession, and also the compelling sense of sin as a reality as a pervasive force that has infected one's being and from which one needs to be purified. Religious tshuva, on the other hand, is future-oriented, animated by yearning and longing. As such, it is motivated by aspiration, but also 
by a sense of shame that one has let the Almighty down and has let one's self down. So it's future oriented, but it's very much motivated by this all encompassing feeling that I had this great relationship with God and I let God down. I disappointed God and I disappointed myself and I've, and I've severed this amazing relationship. So there's a sense of shame. Parenthetically, there's an interesting footnote I would just, and that's for a different sheer and a different topic. Uh, this footnote is fascinating. Some sociologists from Ruth Benedict down speak of shame cultures and guilt cultures. And given Judaism's emphasis upon sin, atonement and sin, they see Judaism as being primarily a guilt culture. This notion is thoroughly erroneous, as will be explained. I want to point out, for those who are familiar with the writings of the late and great and eminent uh, Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, this distinction between shame cultures and guilt cultures was a very big thing in many of his writings. And he wanted to argue very strongly that, um, that in contrast to shame cultures, Judaism is not a shame culture, but a guilt culture. And Rabbi Lichtenstein here takes great issue with that. Now, Rabbi Lichtenstein uh, gave this lecture and many other lectures long before Rabbi Sachs um, wrote on this topic. But I think it's a fascinating topic for someone to write a nice article about, about the distinction the machloket, the debate between Rabbi Lichtenstein and Rabbi Sachs, uh, both of them zichronam livracha, on the place of shame in Jewish culture. It's a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, maybe one day I'll write about it. But again, that's just an aside uh, for those um, who want to pursue that. So again, Rabbi Lichtenstein continues. Chazal note the significance of shame as a factor, as a factor within um within uh oh, sorry did i yeah within the discussion he then continues a few a few uh pages later in this book a, a different essay not a few pages later but in a different drasha again um he discusses uh, maimonides based on the on the talmud has a famous uh, discussion about what kind of repentance and atonement one uh, one is uh, one is necessary to receive atonement for uh, various types of sins, and the Talmud very famously, uh, uh, the Mishnah already divides between what's called kalot and chamurot, uh, sins that are quote unquote light and sins that are quote unquote heavy. And kalot are usually associated with things like not being careful about mitzvot ase, about positive commandments. Uh, you're not so careful about putting on tefillin. If you're not so careful about giving tzedakah. You're not so careful about making sure that you recite kriyat shema, uh, the, the shema every day. And then there's chamurot, the more serious sins, which also go up in gradation. You can have a sin like uh, eating non-kosher, speaking uh, lashon hara, speaking evil speech, um, harming another person, punching someone in the face. And then you have the ultimate sins that receive um, the greatest level of, of punishment, which are, you know, can be capital punishment and, and others even beyond that, where even capital punishment may not be enough to atone for what you did. For famously, Rambam talks about Chilul Hashem, desecration of God's name, is one of those categories where it's not enough to even do teshuva, um, and it's not enough to be punished. It's kind of, you, have, you die before you get full atonement, as opposed to if you don't put on tefillin, uh, you don't get punished. There's no, there's no uh, lashes, there's no malkot, uh, there's no fine for not putting on tefillin. You do teshuva. So, so in this context, um, uh, he, Rabbi Lichtenstein, once again, uh, talks about 
um, the following. Um, Plutarch, the great uh, Greek writer, Draco himself, when asked why he had decreed the death penalty for a great majority of offenses, replied that he considered the minor ones deserved it, and for the major ones, no heavier punishment was left. There is substance to, the, to this approach. The Yushalmi recounts, prophecy was asked, very famous Midrash, when God created the world. Prophecy was asked, a sinner, what is his punishment? It answered, the soul that sins shall die. No question is raised as to which sin it was, whether major or minor, kalot, chamurot. If a person sheds the role of a mitzvah, remember I mentioned that at the beginning, if a person decides to ignore God's commandment, one is com who is commanded and instead usurps the role of a mitzvah, commander, that is the ultimate rebellion. Though sometimes the severity is mitigated by circumstances and some sins are committed through weakness rather than rebellion, Nevertheless, the bottom line is one gave preference to one's own will over the Almighty's. In this sense, when a person confronts not just a particular Aveira, but the critical existential question of whose will is to prevail, his or God's, the proper confession is simply to recognize one's rebellion. It's chatati, aviti, pashati, lefanecha. We say in the confessional, I sinned, I engaged in iniquity, I was rebellious before you. That is one aspect of tshuva. But it is not the only one. Tshuva entails a plethora of aspects because sin is multifaceted. Again, he comes back to the same five categories over and over again. Five different aspects of sin can be singled out. One is the wrong per se, the choice of doing evil. Second is the fact that evil transgresses the will of God. Over and above murder being murdered is also something which God has prescribed. Third, one must consider the ramifications, the contamination of self and the impurity. Fourth, to find God's will as a personal front to him. There is a fifth, fifth result. One's relationship to God has been impaired. Sin opens a chasm and sets a barrier. Again, he quotes the verse from Yeshayahu Perek Nuntet, the same idea. If a person wants to engage in tshuva, he needs to relate to all these elements and affect a tikkun, a repair. There needs to be a tikkun hachet, a tikkun of the sin, moral tshuva, and a tikkun of one's relationship with God, religious tshuva, and a tikkun of the self. Each of these three types of tikkun should be examined independently, and, and in order to do so, we need to distinguish between two veins of tshuva. Here, Rabbi Lichtenstein adds another theme which he loves to mention, which is the idea of, if you look in the Torah, the Torah, um, and Tanakh, excuse me, Tanakh often uses two different distinct, distinct terms uh, when it discusses tshuva. It talks about turning away from evil, sur ra, but it also talks about and reaching good, the tov. The former is ex exemplified by the verse, okay? Suru, suru, or shuvu, shuvu midarchechem haraim. The prophet Yechezkel says, turn away from your evil ways. From shuvu, shuvu midarchechem haraim. And let the wicked one forsake his ways and the iniquid man his thoughts. Ya'azov, as we say on a fast day, ya'azov rashad darko, the ish aven machshavotav. You're supposed to turn away from sin. However, the second approach is tshuva not from something, but tshuva to something. Very similar to the very famous distinction uh, of, um, of Isaiah Berlin about negative freedom and positive freedom, uh, freedom from and freedom to, same idea that was very popular. The latter is exemplified by verses that discuss not what a person is leaving, but where he's headed. Shuvu elai va'ashuva aleichem. Return to me, and I will return to you. Shuva Yisrael ad Hashem Elokecha. In the book of Hosea, Shuva Yisrael ad Hashem Elokecha. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. So tikkun achet is a matter of one, turning from your evil ways, and two, um, and that you have to get involved in the detail, the gravity, specifics, 
how to repair the damage. This requires great attention to detail. There are religious traditions and schools of thought that not only neglect attention to detail, but even scorn it. The Lutheran tradition, for example, believes that one is so suffused with sin that the only thing to do is to try to make peace with God, whether actively or passively, waiting for divine grace or seeking it. But acting to fix minor or major failings is not relevant. Some call this a religious as opposed to moral, where religious refers to focusing upon religion, one's relation with God and moral. If one adopts this focus, then one indeed does not need to differentiate among sins. If you're just talking about relationship, so whether you're talking about a small Avera or a big Avera, that's not the key. The key is to, to restore the relationship. Neither the quality the kind of sin is as important as the existence of the barrier, moral versus religious. There is something to be said in approach that does not content itself solely with picking up the pieces, with trying to adjust, but rather seeks rehabilitation by establishing a new to bridge to the Almighty. Yet though we understand what cannot focus solely on detail, and in tshuva particularly, surely we believe that there is a moral element of tshuva and of divine service, a need to right the wrong and terminate its, its, perpu, its perpetuation. Okay, so you have to have both. Classic Rabbi Lichtenstein, you need to have the focus on details as well as the sweep and the grandeur of trying to repair the relationship with God. Another example, uh, later on in a different drasha called Mediocre Tshuva, it's a great title, and the Tshuva of the Mediocre, great title. Um, so Rabbi Lichtenstein talks about this same idea. The third element of complete Tshuva is the element of aspiration. What is one's vision? What does one dream about in bed at night and in the course of his daily activity. Tshuva can be truly mediocre if it is devoid of aspiration. Such tshuva lacks vision. One might search and examine, per perhaps with the proper motivation, but is not part of any grand vision or continuous process. His acts of tshuva are a series of islands, a whole archipelago perhaps, but there is no yearning, and that's what makes a tshuva mediocre. So much of tshuva is about yearning. Again, it's about, as he continues, Tshuva has two fundamental challenges, channels, excuse me, moral and religious. Again, moral, religious. These two channels can be seen in the linguistic presentation of tshuva in our traditional text as being tshuva from, we turn away from sin, and tshuva to. The moral channel is tshuva from, the impetus to respond to sin and evil, and Okay, turn, turn from your evil ways. That a sinner should repent from his sin. There is recoil or revulsion. However, this recoil has a positive side as well. Um, which one has left his evil ways and has assumed a new night, a lifestyle, and possibly a new identity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The religious channel is being drawn to something, not may. Hachet ela el Hashem. Shuvu ad Hashem. Come, let us turn back to the Lord. Okay? You're, it's about strengthening your connection to God. To engage in this type of tshuva, one must yearn to repair his relationship with God and once more enjoy his favor. One must aspire to have access. Both channels, the moral and the religious, include the element of aspiration that is critical to complete tshuva, or, or bit, perhaps in different proportions. This element of aspiration, like the elements of initiative, is wholly endemic, fully accessible, ultimately it is hope, thoroughly, thoroughly characteristic of the tshuva of the mediocre, meaning every person, even if they're a mediocre spiritual personality, can on their own level aspire to do better, both in the moral realm and the religious realm. Even the most mediocre spiritual can and must transcend the bounds of mediocrity and attain previously unscaled heights. Perhaps developing a fresh identity in the process. Striving is the key. I wanted to just show you that in Hebrew, Rabbi Lichtenstein um, said um, in a drasha that he gave in Ivrit, he didn't change his tune, <laughs> but had the same idea 
again, as a central theme of his worldview. Uh, in this Truva Drasha, he's discussing um, the concepts of avodah, of avodah Tashem, service of God, which is often in rabbinic literature uh, connected with three primary uh, channels, korbanot, sacrifices, tefillah, prayer, and Talmud Torah, the study of Torah. And what Rabbi Lichtenstein wants to argue is that tshuva too should be thrown into this uh, triad of tshuva is also a, a parade example of the idea of avodat Hashem, service of God. And here he says, mitzad echad, from one on one side, Adam a person has to carefully um, evaluate what his ways and check what he's done. And you cannot do tshuva without, you know, fixing the details of your life. If you don't work on the little things in life, somebody who speaks in lofty terms, if you think that you're going to reach the heavens, without the heavy work, the difficult work, he's fooling himself. There is people who in one act achieve the world to come. But the mainstream approach, but the mainstream approach of tshuva is to go through the channels of tshuva as formulated as a normative mitzvah. However, on the other hand, there is an aspect of tshuva, which is not about the details, but about developing and reestablishing the relationship between the person and his relationship with God. The first aspect of Sha'alikhanot Musari, you can call moral. That relates to what a person did. The evil. And you're trying to fix them. Shuvu, shuvu, mi what you did. The second approach, it's a religious tshuva. It's about repairing the relationship between God and fixing it. Shuva, Shuva Yisrael, ad Hashem Elokecha. Return until up to the Lord. He has to return um, like a, a, a servant before his uh, a master. Okay, so this is um, the central distinction that Rabbi Salave, that Rabbi Lichtenstein uh, made in his conception of tshuva throughout the years was the moral religious distinction, which which dovetailed the distinction between tshuva from and tshuva to, which dovetailed the notion of focusing on details as opposed to fo focusing on your the whole breadth of the person's personality and connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We now, I'm sorry, we now uh, go back for a second to, and we will now go to the uh, third major um, element that Rabbi Lichtenstein loved to talk about in his tshuva lectures, which for him was a major theme of all of his educational philosophy and was, in his mind, one of his important messages to the contemporary community that looked to him for guidance, specifically the modern Orthodox community, meaning the Haredi community didn't look to him for guidance. He talked to the people who were his students and were the people who turned to him. And so in this context, if we go, lefashvesh means to delve and seek exactly what you're looking for. It's like lefashvesh b'ma'asav, to search, to search carefully uh, what you're doing. Okay. If we look at the this third element, and I will, okay, 
the third element um, in this, in the context of the sins, the contemporary sins that he discusses of confessing your wrongdoing of your moral and religious act. He discusses the idea, uh, which I mentioned before, that can a person have partial tshuva or not? And he comes down on the, on the side that while we certainly, there's certainly a demand in the tradition for total tshuva, uh, he says that can be overwhelming. Will our normal stumbling selves, willing of spirit, but weak of flesh, plugging a hole here, be barred at the door? If few of us ever get beyond the selective and fragmented, will that tshuva be dismissed? We only hope and pray that the answer is no. So he says that certainly when it comes to moral tshuva, we know that we ne may not necessarily be able to plug every hole. What then of our sound intuition that purity cannot be partial, that the religious aspect of tshuva must be complete? I believe that our intuitions and our hopes can be reconciled in light of an analogy drawn from a different area. So very famous Mishnah has a very radical statement. The Mishnah says, Rav Dostoy son of Rav Yanai says, if a person has forgotten a single thing from what he's learned, the verse regards him as if he has in, in fact abandoned his own being. As the verse states, I'm sorry, one second, let me make this smaller again. Yeah, and let me make it bigger again. As the verse states, beware very much and watch your soul very much, lest you forget the things which your eyes saw. Are we to understand applies even to one whose studies have overpowered him? It's just too much to remember. You're not, you don't have a photographic memory. People are people. They have a lot of things on their mind. They have to take the kids to school, to camp, to the doctor. You have to make a living. Are we really held to such a standard? I forget something I learned. It's as if I'm liable for my life. The verse concludes, unless they depart from your heart and all the days of your life. A person is only liable if he sits down and uproots them from his heart. So the Mishnah distinguishes between being overwhelmed by your studies and you naturally forget something, as opposed to sitting down and consciously uprooting it. What is the meaning if he sits down and uproots it from his heart? According to Rabbi Yona, this applies not only when a person tries to forget, such as when Rabbi Zera fasted upon arriving in Israel in order to forget what he learned previously. It includes even the failure to review adequately. Given the natural human a thought that should frighten yeshiva students who don't review adequately. But setting aside Rabbi Yona's, it is clear that there's a cardinal difference between sitting down and forgetting and uprooting them. What characterizes this distinction? So Rabbi Lichtenstein doesn't want to go down the route of Rabbi Yon. Sitting down and uprooting refers to a person who forgets not with grief, but with indifference. Not with a sense of loss, but with insouciance. Whether he remembers or doesn't remember is not so important to him. This is a person to whom ignorance of a certain tract of Torah is of little moment. A person whose commitment to learning is partial, not only in terms of accomplishment, but aspiration and value. Being overpowered by one study is the opposite of this. The pressure of circumstances, new material he learned, and other factors brought about the forgetfulness. Unable as he sees to more, he finds himself with limited knowledge, but he also thirsts for more. Analogously, with regard to partial truth, I believe we need to distinguish between falling short and actively uprooting. Again, recognizing that we are human, recognizing that we can't all remember and we can't achieve the grandeur that we always want, 
There's a difference between someone who falls short and actively uproot. So tshuva is analogous to Talmud Torah. If a person strives out of a sense of commitment and engagement for a totality of tshuva, but moves on that path slowly and incrementally, encountering difficulties such that he's unable, this is tshuva which strives for purification and thus attains purity. A person who strives, Rabbi Lichtenstein often would say that on his matseva, on his grave, he wanted people to say, Hishtadel, he tried as hard as he could. That's a major theme in much of his writings, that you worked, you put in all the effort you could. Not everybody is granted the same level of spiritual energy. Not everyone is granted the same level of cognitive uh, prowess. But a person who works toward tshuva only in certain areas and is unperturbed by the fact that other areas are unintended may be said to uprooting himself from those other areas. He doesn't care. So there is meaning and value to partial tshuva. First at the level of your confessing, Jew, Judaism recognized the value of even piecemeal, every day, every action, every moment. Second, at the level of purity, provided the tshuva is not a result of lack of concern, but of one's perceived inability to achieve, as long as the striving is there. Okay? This is like a major theme. And he comes back to it, where he says... Um, he says, in the context of hit root, the sense of, so to speak, um, engaging yourself to do better. The famous story about the rabbi who confronted with sin said, Ein hadavar talui elabi, the matter is dependent only on me. Measuring our community, spiritual inattentiveness. How do we, the so-called modern Orthodox or religious Zionist community, measure up to the challenge and the promise? The demand of tshuva is dual, do, confront and respond. And he says that we leave much to be desired. Again, he's writing in the 90s. With respect to the first, the external stimuli compelling us both to come to grips and to connect are often sadly deficient. The sense of distress of impending external danger is by and large, largely absent. Most of us, thank God, know little of the removal of the ring. Removal of a ring is the, is the reference to Haman. Haman, who, when he took off the ring to get approval from Achashverosh, frightened all of Jewry throughout the world when they heard of this. Meaning he's talking about the physical threats to the Jewish people. Again, in the 90s, you know, maybe in the, you could feel that that had passed. Obviously today we don't feel that. As to the impact of the word of God and the awareness, this voice too is often muted. The babble of competing cultural messages permeates the general scene and hence the Jewish world, which by hint of its, modern, dint of its modernity, often in close contact. In this setting, the prospect for self-generated hit or root all also dips very often. In a modern world marked by self-reliance and flooded by consumerist diversions, the soil is often not ripe for the growth of spirituality in general and divine service in particular. Okay? To be sure, as a matter of personal consent, there is much existential con confrontation. But on a mass basis, it is often, often constricted. So again, people don't uh, feel that. They have what he calls in another drasha, or is it, I'm sorry, is it the same, let me just go on, is it the same drasha? Yeah, in the same drasha, he, what he calls, in this context, um, one second, let me make this smaller again, so, so we can go to, uh, to this. Um, where again, he writes, where the Bible talks about how a person can forget God in many different ways. One can rebel against him, one can distort him, and one can ignore him. The danger indigenous to the modern world is clearly the last, that of hesech hadat, simply inattentiveness, a kind of spiritual malaise. 
which is indigenous to the society of success, real or imagined. We read in Ha'azinu, you sure and waxed fat and kicked out. You grew fat, you grew thick, you became obese. He forsook God, his maker, and scorned the rock of his... You disregarded the rock that bore you, and you forgot. You became successful, secure, and then you forgot the creator. It is this danger, hesachadat, or forgetfulness, upon which, against which Moshe Rabbeinu particularly enjoins Knesset Israel, the Jewish people, on the verge of attaining a pinnacle of success. Hesachadat, religiously speaking, is the tragic flaw, the Achilles heel of the modern world, general and Jewish. This is not total oblivious, but rather inattentiveness, a degree of neglect. Okay? And this is the idea, spiritual inattentiveness. That's the idea uh, behind this. And this is something, uh, what I wanted to show you in another book. Uh, he says this again in other writings, which became very famous, a very famous essay that he wrote on Teshuva in a book called By His Light, which was a, a lecture that he gave. There's a second level, one which we denominate not as shichicha, forgetting, but hesachadat, a lack of attention. Here we deal not with a total lack of knowledge or recollection, but with an individual community in whose memory the relevant information is properly stored. They could probably respond, but they do not actively focus their attention. Their mind is elsewhere upon other concerns. Okay, A person, they talk about, again, this is the idea of hesachadat. You're just inattentive religiously to this. And this, of course, he comes back to this. Um, again, he talks about this in terms of the mitzvah of remembering, um, remembering uh, Sinai and not forgetting Sinai. And, and he says, um, in this context, if we ask ourselves, right, um, okay, I thought I... Uh, um, I thought I'd, okay, insufficient appreciation and improper evaluation, okay? Total oblivious and inattentiveness. So there's total oblivious and inattentiveness, and this is part of the dilemma that confronts uh, the, modern, uh, the modern Jew. So these are the main aspects, I'm sorry, these are the main aspects um, that cut across all of Rabbi Lichtenstein's writings on tshuva, the moral versus religious distinction, the five categories of sin, which you divide and categorize into the moral and religious, tshuva to and tshuva from, um, and the kind of sin par excellence for Rabbi Lichtenstein is not so much that you're going to rebel against God, that's not so much the sin of the modern uh, observant Orthodox Jew, but the challenge is in a world so suffused with modernity and with the values of modernity and that were buffeted by so much um, compelling messages and conflicting messages, that there's a, a level of, of chastening of our passion, of our desire to grow religiously, spiritually. There's a kind of uh, and that's what he constantly uh, when he wanted to, so to speak, translate the, you know, kind of the more esoteric ca categories of tshuva to the here and now, confronting the modern Orthodox Jew, as he perceived it, as he saw as his mission, this was what he constantly would come back to. So these are the major themes that Rav Aaron uh, uh, wrote about. Okay, so what are we going to do next time? What we're going to do next time is two things. We are going to, uh, number one, uh, go back and use some of the distinctions that Rabbi Lichtenstein uh, used um, and the key elements and talk about how that manifests itself in the uh, distinction that he saw between the tshuva of Rosh Hashanah and the tshuva of Yom Kippur. Um, this becomes also a major like idea of Rabbi Lichtenstein to try to somehow ferret out 
what's the difference between the focus of tshuva when we talk about Rosh Hashanah as opposed to Yom Kippur? Because Yom Kippur seems to have its unique element of tshuva, and Rosh Hashanah seems to, we also, it's the beginning of Aseris Yimei Tshuva, it's the beginning of the 10 days of Pentecost. So there is some element of tshuva, even though we don't do vidui on uh, Rosh Hashanah, we do say Avinu Malkeinu, we do, so, so what is the difference between the tshuva of Rosh Hashanah and the tshuva of Yom Kippur? So that's going to be a major element of the, of the, of the, of the next, of the uh, next class. Uh, and then we're going to uh, highlight a couple of smaller uh, themes that Rabbi Lichtenstein repeats and comes back to. Uh, and, you know, maybe if we have time, after all that, we will uh, look at one particular drasha in depth um, together and, and, and maybe say something uh, about that. So that's, that's the goal of the last class. I wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. I wish everybody a wonderful week. And again, we have in mind, we have on our, you know, we have in mind what's going on in Israel and the safety of all of uh, Am Yisrael uh, and the safety of all innocent people. And um, we hope that there will be peace and security for everybody um, in the region.